there's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. We can't explain uh, how they moved, their trajectory. Uh, they, they did not have um, an easily explainable pattern. And so, you know, I, th I think that we're, uh, people still take seriously trying to investigate and figure out what that is. There are things flying around up there that we haven't fully identified yet. And keep in mind, there are a, a basically a billion galaxies in an ever expanding universe. I mean, you can't even get your mind around the sheer number of things that are out there. But you've seen this. And <laughs> you've seen the, the data. <laughs> well, no one knows, but I think that the probability is that there's something you would call life somewhere else. The mission of ATIP was quite simple. It was to collect and analyze information involving anomalous uh, aerial vehicles. Uh, what I guess in the vernacular you, you call them UFOs. We call them UAPs. You know how this sounds. It sounds nutty, wacky. Look, Bill, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you that, that it doesn't sound wacky. What I'm telling you is real. The question is, what is it? What are its intentions? What are its capabilities? So this is a Pentagon. This is a DO, Department of Defense official saying, stop looking at UFOs because they're demonic? Correct. He told me, he said, Lou, I want you to stop, stop doing this. I said, okay, sir, I, I certainly can, but may I ask why? And he says, well, we already know what it is. He asked me point blank, have you read your Bible lately? And I said, well, sir, I, 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 I think I know what it says. What, where are you going with this? And he said, well, then you would know that these things are, are demonic and we should not be pursuing them. The, the showings of the angels or the showings of God always showed up as orbs of light or things like that. And today we see this as, uh, we see these as, we, we call them UFOs. A pillar of fire at night and confused Russian troops. It has some asking, are Ukrainians receiving heavenly help? There's some miracle happen. It looked like some spaceship sh that, like there was like an attack from the spaceship. There was some kind of a lightning was starting shooting from the sky and, and like sparks were going, were like spreading everywhere. And then they, on the morning, they discovered that the whole, the whole machinery was destroyed. The Defense Intelligence Agency has just released that program's 2010 report on UFOs. And among other things, the document tells us the government can prove that UFO sightings have caused radiation burns, paralysis, and brain damage. The report also says that some people who saw UFOs experienced, quote, perceived time suspension. They also saw ghosts and other spirits. In all, that report lists 42 cases of adverse effects from medical files and another 300 adverse effects from unpublished cases, whatever that means. My name is Matthew Roberts. I was a cryptologic technician in the U.S. Navy for 16 years. I found myself watching the footage over and over again, almost obsessively. I, uh, I started to have these follow-on experiences with the phenomenon. That was like the beginning of seeing non-human entities in my room at night. Because my job was classified and I had access to classified, um, I was kind of aware this was not a one-off event for the Navy. This, uh, these things happen frequently, all the time. They happen all the time. Barbara Bethalic, Whitley Strever, both of them, before I came across one, they had interviewed people that part of what they experienced was encountering a former live relative. In other words, they were encountering a dead relative on the craft. These entities have the ability to appear in any form. We're now less than 16 minutes away. I... Uh 
was involved with occult practices for almost a full decade. And um, after my conversion, if you will, I felt it, I was in the kitchen by myself and I felt it come up next to me and I said out loud, I said, God, whatever this is that's been posing as grandma for the past seven years, in Jesus' name, get it away from me and never let it come back. And it hasn't been back since. What do you think that was? Just a hallucination a, or a... To be perfectly honest, a demon. Yeah. That's my understanding of ghosts, any anything of that kind of sort. You don't believe Aliens. in ghosts? I don't. Revelation 16 says these unclean spirits, they go and they perform signs and wonders. <laughs> and Jesus warns in the Gospel of Luke, and it's repeated in the book of Acts chapter, new, uh, chapter 2, that there will be signs in the heavens. And a lot of people are going to be seeing things in the skies in the last days. The Bible says that in prophecy. So we need to know what the truth is, what to believe and what not to believe, because I think that uh, evil spirits are going to use that to manipulate people in the last days. And, and define what that acronym is. Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. Okay. And so the government has had, and this has been in the news very recently, have had lots of trouble with this. I, in my own time, was studying this stuff at the same time in California. Yep. Wow. And so both of us, with, at, separately, without communicating, we're studying this and going, wow, there is something going on here. Right. Since this is out, it's in Congress, and they're discussing right. this right now. This isn't conspiracy. Sure, anymore. sure. Yeah, something absolutely. Something going on here. Absolutely. Now, I saw, the, I saw the little documentary you guys put together like that. It's very eye-opening. The belief in UFOs is now a new global belief system. It's different than a religion, but it's religious-like. What they're seeing in the sky today is what they believe to be like advanced technology. Whereas a thousand years ago, they would think maybe that's an angel or maybe that's a demon. Today, they look up and they say, well, that's a UFO. When a person has an experience, say they see a UFO, they're different afterwards. I know this sounds really strange, but the relationship to the cosmos changed for these people. Almost like a religious conversion experience. It changes their worldview, it changes the way they work, it changes their relationships to people. It fundamentally, completely changes them. And it messes with their concept of who we are in relation to the universe. My name is Tom DeLong. Most people know me as the founder of the popular rock and roll band called Blink-182. I started a company called To The Stars that eventually became To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science. We are literally the group that is responsible for why you read about UFOs in the papers today without all the stigma. When people start to understand more about the UFO phenomenon, the, the term the occult in that whole world is much more a part of the UFO phenomenon than, and, 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 and that's part of what makes it more complex than just little green men and flying saucers and tinfoil hats. And mind you, as we'll talk about this in a little bit, it's not all coming from me, it's coming from other people of the highest places. There is a very, very strong link between what people think demons are from the Bible and other religions um, and the UFO phenomenon. And what you have is something that doesn't like man, period. And something that feels um, either jealous of or um, has some kind of plan for what man uh, is to be. Well, we've passed the 11 minute mark. Now T minus 10 minutes, 54 seconds on our countdown. But what they're saying to us now is it's going to affect Christian belief. There is a professor for the Pope's uh, uh, University in Rome, and uh, uh, he is a very highly respected intellectual. Uh, his last name is Tenzniti, and he has written a paper now in which he is saying that very soon, not, a, not right in the beginning, we won't have to um, deny our Christian faith in the beginning. But there is information coming from another world, and once it is confirmed, it is going to require a rereading of the gospel as we know it. And that's the kind of information that we are receiving from the highest levels of Vatican intelligentsia.
If you're an alien and you want to get baptized, the Pope is in favor of it. Pope Francis reiterated his view Monday that everyone has the right to be baptized. And apparently that invite extends even to Martians. Over the next 10 years, I have now worked with over 400 cases of people that have been able to stop the abduction experience in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. This is documented evidence. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians are going to be considered to be the enemy. Then terrorists would be identified. Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. And the next enemy was asteroids. And the funniest one of all was against what he called alien. And over and over and over during the four years that I knew him and was giving his speeches for him, he would bring up that last card. And remember, Cal, the last card is the alien card. We're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens. And all of it, he said, is a lie. Are there other religions, I'm curious, David, um, that, that you know of in all the, the research that you've done that are more open to the idea? Yeah, I would say there are. Uh, you know, Hindus uh, and Buddhists, uh, you know, Tibetans and whatnot, the idea of uh, extraterrestrial life and things like that, I think is, is they have no problem with that. And UFOs, uh, particularly in Hindu and Buddhist uh, tradition, they have UFOs. UFOs have been flying around for thousands of years, according to them. They call them Vimanas. They have old texts about it. Uh, and so that's the other thing, say, with the Vatican, too, is that UFO sightings have been going on for thousands of years. Uh, uh, Mormons as well believe in extraterrestrial life. And uh, I mean, they are also a religion that, that wouldn't have any problems with that. I think a lot of you know modern day religions don't have a problem with life on other planets. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. You are saying to the human race, for the first time, an official intelligence representative at a high level from the US government is saying publicly, we are not alone. We're definitely not alone. Absolutely, the data points empirically that we're not alone, yeah. The Inspector General made a determination about the credibility of your complaint. They found, after interviewing myself and the subjects, and other subjects that I'm not even uh, cognizant on who they were, they found my complaint uh, urgent and credible uh, for the intelligence committees. Do you believe our government has made contact with intelligent extraterrestrials? Something I can't discuss in public setting. Have human beings been hurt or killed by a non-human intelligence? While I can't get into the specifics, because that would reveal uh, certain U.S. classified in, uh, operations, uh, I was briefed by a few individuals on the program that there were um, malevolent events like that. So let me be very clear about this. You're saying that the Catholic Church, the Vatican, mm -hmm. they know about the existence of non-human intelligence on this planet. Certainly. I would couch it as non-human intelligence, you know, NHI, like we would like to say in our, our language. Why do you say that? Why do you say NHI? I don't want to necessarily denote origin. I don't think we have all the data to say, oh, they're coming from a certain, a certain location. Who in the government either, what agency, sub-agency, what contractors, who should be called into the next hearing about UAPs, either in a public setting or even in a private setting? And, and you probably can't name names, but what agencies or organizations, contractors, et cetera, do we need to call in to get these questions answered, whether it's about funding, what programs are happening, and what's out there? I can give you a specific cooperative and hostile witness list of specific individuals uh, that were in those. And, and how soon can we get that list? I'm happy to provide that to you after the hearing. I think that, uh, I think they are very real, but I think what is your idea of reality? That's the question. You see that the DOD and NASA even, they're all hiring physicists to 
work on this UFO issue. And that's not where the truth of this lies. This lies more within the realm of the humanities, within the realm of psychology, uh, philosophy, religious studies. Um, that's, that's where you're gonna find the truth of this. But I don't think these are people from another planet. I still think these are what people call angels. I think they're messengers. I mean, I'm dying to know what they've got to say. We're now passing the four minute 30 second mark in the countdown, still go at this time. So in reality, Roger, you were chosen mm -hmm. by high powered demon spirits yeah. to be a part of their human special privileged mm -hmm. group. He says, we are the elite. We know the real truth about the master and his angels. And the priest uh, told us, could I have a bit more of your time? I want to do something very fascinating. He says, the grand plan for, for, for harvesting the multitudes of the earth into his cause just before the close of the great controversy between the forces of good and evil. And he said, it's going to be done in a unique manner. This, this grand plan he says, is, is going to take people, people are going to eat the stuff because he says, spirits, demon spirits will declare themselves to be inhabitants of far distant planets in the galaxies that are coming to warn the inhabitants of planet Earth of the impending destruction of the planet unless something seriously proper is done to avoid it. It was a big thing that uh, was coming up, one of the uh, major deceptions of the last days. Boom. Man, this is going to be an interesting episode. Man, I learned a lot this week, and I'm going to show you guys something very interesting that's happening right now. But more than that, we have an interesting show. More about that later. But just be prepared, because you're going to learn things you didn't know before. It's going to be very fascinating. So make sure you hang out, have fun tonight, and talk to us in the chat. In fact, tell us where you are three from. T-minus three minutes counting. T-minus three. We are go with all elements of the mission at this time. <laughs> I'm usually pretty good at that, but I forgot about him talking there. Yeah, just go ahead and chat with us here in the chat. In the live stream, if you are here, tell me where you're from. Just past the two minute mark in the countdown. T minus one minute, 54 seconds and counting. All indications uh, coming in uh, to the control center at this time indicate we are go. Guidance system goes on internal at 17 seconds, leading up to the ignition sequence at 8.9 seconds. T minus 60 seconds and counting. We pass T minus 60. we were never meant to solve. But who we are and why we are here are not among them. The 
ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Strange Normal. My name is Bradley. We talk about the stranger things that happen in your normal life to give you a biblical understanding of what is going on because there's a lot happening and there's going to be a lot happening in the future here. So you need to understand what is happening. Many people have to understand what this is all about because if you don't, you're going to be confused and there's not going to be a lot of time to figure it out. That's the important part of this whole thing. And that's why we weekly go over this topic to try to understand from the Bible and also looking deeply into the facts that have been stated through the news and also a little bit of the lore, uh, what is actually going on? What is the truth about what is going on? And this is the only channel on the, I'd say, YouTube, I'm sure there's other people doing this too, but I can't find them, that actually talk about and have answers for this problem. Everywhere else that we talk about this, everywhere else that I don't talk about this, uh, they have questions that have no answers. So let's get into those answers tonight, but before we do, I'm going to bring in our guests tonight, David and Matthew. Guys, thank you so much for joining me tonight. How are you? I'm going to start with you, David. I'm doing well. Very good. David, if everyone doesn't know, he was been on our show before, and he is uh, formerly Mormon, uh, I should say, Latter-day Saints. And uh, he uh, is going to have very good insights into a few different things tonight, I'm, I'm sure. He hasn't seen the clips ahead of time, so he's probably, I'm probably making him sweat bullets because okay. of this. <laughs> but, but Matthew, how are you tonight? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Glad to be here. You know, okay. it's, it's always good when it's a strange normal night. <laughs> That's right. That's right. This is going to be fascinating because we got some uh, a very interesting thing. I'm not sure if I put my show notes in the notes of the video, but I have them in the Discord. So let me bring them up here real quick. This primarily, the content for tonight uh, was a four-hour podcast that I probably listened to twice. Not because it was um, super uh, a lot of content, but be- because I have to scrub through it and cut it up in order to get the really good clips out of it. But I watched it on double speed to figure that out. And this was sent to us by Ismael Cortez. Thank you, Ismael, for, for doing that, because this is um, this is a very interesting one that I, I must have missed. And uh, it's it's the podcast is the Ryan, the Sean Ryan show. And he, he's got a podcast by his name on YouTube where he interviews a few different people. And one of the ones he interviewed tonight was Brandon Fugel. Is that how you say his last name, Fugel? Brandon Fugel, I don't know. But he is the owner of Skinwalker Ranch. And so what is this? So I'm, I'm trying to define all this stuff for people that don't know what's going on here because I realize that uh, this channel isn't made for people that know a lot about the UFO lore. As I've grown into this over the several years that I've been covering this, uh, we actually, I should say, we we kind of all kind of understand this a little bit better. But so what? That's that's number one. Let's take what is Skinwalker Ranch. Um, let me kind of define it. You guys, uh, if you want to uh, add on to it, uh, go go right ahead after I'm done. But Skinwalker Ranch is this ranch somewhere in the United States. I haven't pulled that up, but it's it's a it's it's a, got some unique characteristics about it because the government. This is factual. The government has actually done some um, some interesting uh, black projects. They funded some money to kind of look into the what is going on in this location because it's a very strange location. It has a lot of, dare I say, spiritual activity in this location. Why is the government doing in in that? Why would they be doing that? That's that's the question. Brandon Fugel. Who is that? Brandon Fugel is a uh, entrepreneur. He is a real estate mogul who got started very early in life and is eight, uh, 18 years old uh, selling business real estate. And he bought the property from um, Robert Bigelow, I think is his name, who uh, does a lot of research, much like um, Lockheed Martin, I believe. I believe he's a government contractor. I could be wrong about that. But um that's kind of the premise we're setting. So why is it so interesting? Well, number one, we got a lot of spiritual activity we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about his testimony. But number two, Brandon has an interesting background. 
and uh, we're going to describe that real quick. Before we get into it, I, I want to ask each one of you if you have any comments on that. You don't have to say anything, but uh, if you if you have anything to say before we go into our first clip, uh, I'm going to ask you first, David. I don't have much to say. I'm very ignorant about Skinwalker Ranch, to be honest. Sure. Matthew. Yeah, I'd say I know uh, the basics of Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, it's kind of in the same it's in the mythos you know you have area 51 out in nevada you got roswell in new mexico mount shasta out in california and then you have skinwalker in utah it's interesting it's kind of in this uh western part of uh, america and a lot of it is uh tied in and related to native american traditions and spiritualism and that's usually referred to as the claim it's a skinwalker the name of it alone is a comes from a native native american myth of the this terrible creature so uh, it's it's kind of baked in and i imagine that these places and places similar to it will eventually be uh, explained to us uh, mm -hmm. we're such primitive beings that we're going to need an explanation why why was this such an interesting spot and i think we're going to hear some really bizarre stuff when it comes to these things but as for right now yeah i would say i know the basics but i'm about to learn a lot more aren't i brad <laughs> you sure are. this is this is very interesting stuff and as we dig into this further we'll we'll kind of define and extrapolate from these different things the first thing we're going to do though is we're going to dive into who is brandon from his own words uh also uh why uh where did he, what is his background where did he come from and what does he like to do even as a kid and this is very important and you're this is not boring stuff you're going to realize why as you listen to this clip but um let's just cut right into it you want to this is this is this is great uh first clip here we go where did you grow up pleasant grove utah i'm fifth generation pleasant grove utah my ancestors came from scandinavia from denmark and immigrated in the 1860s they were early converts to the the mormon church of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and settled in this small community at the base of Mount Timpanogos, which is this incredible mountain backdrop in Utah. And it lived in a, a small dugout dwelling until they built both the, their, their early home and a blacksmith shop that still stands to this day. So I'm very fortunate to have some incredible ancestors that, uh, that have created a legacy in our community and, and serve as examples. Uh, at, at 19, after spending about 15 months in commercial real estate, I, I elected to go on a, a mission for my church, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and served for two years in Hawaii. But uh, I kept my license active when I entered the mission field, and, uh, and a lot of the transactions that I had teed up that were in process or progress uh, before my mission thankfully came to fruition when I was but a greenie, uh, a, a young missionary at age 19. And uh, it was funny, I, I quickly obtained a brick phone when I entered the mission field, which, which was very unusual. This was 1992, so I'm dating myself here, and, uh, and kept in touch periodically with my office back in Salt Lake uh, to make sure that my, my deals were progressing. And it was funny, I bought my first Armani suit as a Mormon missionary on a bike. Uh, <laughs> I bought it from the, the Italian menswear store at uh, Kahala Mall, which was kind of the posh mall uh, right outside of uh, Honolulu at the time. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it, was a fr it was a fun reward, I guess, uh, to treat me myself to that after selling some buildings and and having those deals come to fruition. So even though I was focused on my my mission and my my missionary service, I was fortunate to see transactions close for a period of time that I had uh, placed under contract before before leaving for Hawaii, which was an unlikely uh, mission call for me. I mean, most of my friends were going to to foreign lands. I mean, whether it be Chile or or Germany, 
uh, or other places, and to to get a call to Hawaii was uh, was quite a surprise for me. So it, it sounds like there was uh, somewhat of a life changing experience. Changed my entire life. Every day of my life uh, has been influenced by that two year mission experience that I had. The relationships forged, the lessons learned uh, during that period of time. I mean, that's such a formative time in anyone's life, in any young person's life. You think of what happens between ages 18 or 19 and 21, and that's a period of time where where you're making decisions as to who you are and how you view the world and, and what kind of person you're going to be. And to be in a position where, you, where I was focused on Jesus Christ and teaching people the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and even just performing service, just helping people. I mean, at the time, uh, the islands were hit by Hurricane Iniki. There was a huge hurricane that came in and destroyed uh, a lot of the communities. And that was a heck of a way to start my mission. <laughs> Uh, you know, we had, you know, power power lines down, uh, entire living spaces that were that were flooded as a result. A lot of destruction, and for a period of weeks, we didn't really teach anyone about Jesus Christ. All we cared about was helping people clean up the disaster and the mess. And that service experience uh, was was really important. It was, uh, it was, I think, Christianity at, it, at its best, to see neighbors coming together, to see communities working together in the face of destruction, in the face of this natural disaster that had taken place, and to, to be able to, to work to help people dig out of that you know, with no, no thought of compensation. I mean, we're, we're, we're just there to help. You know, we're, we're there as missionaries without any money. <laughs> yeah. And not looking for any compensation and, and just wanting to roll our sleeves up and, and help. And that was, that was an important experience for me. The, the whole experience with Hurricane Iniki at the beginning of my mission uh, really set the right tone for the rest of my experience. Okay, we'll pause it right there just for a second. This is interesting to me because he says that the beginning of his his uh, his journey in life, I mean, the 19, 18, 19, 20, that's formative years still, and you're, you're still trying to get your feet on the ground and you go on this, this mission where you primarily go out, and maybe you can speak a little more to this, David, but you go out and you you go door to door and help people and then a big hurricane comes through town and and you decide well it's time to go really help people and so he said he he created this in his mind this mindset of service which is fantastic i think that's a great thing everybody should have but i think it's also interesting tying to what he's about to talk about skinwalker ranch i think he's tying this in for a reason there's a service he's providing here. What that is yet, I have yet to figure out, but keep that in the back of your mind. He also said that um, uh, he was a Mormon missionary, and what he was on mission, and uh, it's, it's fascinating to me that he was able to go and, uh, and have a, a cell phone, a brick phone. You know, back there in the 90s, he had this enormous phone, and he was able to do real estate deals while he was on mission. The Mormons that came to my house, they couldn't even use the internet. I, I don't know what was going on with this guy. So I, was, I wanted to ask you, um, <laughs> David, I, I don't know, I forget if you had been on mission or, or what, whatever in, in your life, but uh, what, what, tell us a little bit more about, what are your thoughts? What is going through your, through your head right now? Oh, I'm in total agreement with what he said about his description of a mission. Um, totally changed your life two years away from home. Like you're totally devoted to studying scripture, teaching people, helping people. It does change your life. I've never heard of anyone selling real estate on a mission, though. That is um, <laughs> something else. That's something. Yeah. And, and so I wonder, uh, did they have stipulations while you were on mission on what you could and could not do? I mean, I, I thought the guys told oh, yeah, me we that... Yeah, we live a very... Missionaries live a very strict lifestyle, that's for sure. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. I, it m- might have changed over the years, but I know even now. Um, I don't think it's changed much. No, nothing's changed, really. Wow. I Besides for introduction, introduction of like phones and internet, but even then, it's still pretty restricted. I would say. Okay. All right. Interesting. Well, well, everything that you're doing when you're on the mission is provided by the Church of Latter Day Saints, correct? Because I had um, I talked with a couple of uh, different. Uh, the door knockers that were going around and, and I, uh, I managed to have some of them over and I was like, yeah, I mean, come over. And for a while they were coming on a weekly basis. Eventually uh, I got a little weird because they, they changed up who they were sending <laughs> to, to me. And I just like opened my door. Cause I was expecting the same guys. I opened my door and it's like two completely different people. I'm like, uh, hello. Did I invite you here? Oh no, we're the missionaries. <laughs> what happened to the other two guys? Did you disappear them? But <laughs> <laughs> and conversations with them. Uh, it, I I got to know there. It is. It seems to be a very controlled environment. That the the apartment that they were staying in, or uh, the condos that they were staying in, were all owned. By either members or like indirect ownership by the church. So it it does seem to be a very controlled environment. Is it was that the case with your experience? Yeah, it sounds similar. Yeah. Yeah, you, the missionaries spend at least six six weeks in an area. It can go up to like six months. I've I've heard that they rotate out one. I, I, uh, maybe I was I, I was wrong, but they they tend to every six weeks one disappears and the other one comes. Is is that how it works? I don't know anything That's about right, this. Yeah. So so anything any information you can provide is amazing. But um, and so the church provides the locations, or is it Mormon uh, homes that open up their home for people, or? It can be both. The area I served in, we had apartments. We didn't stay with members, but I hear there are places in America where they actually live with members. So. Hmm. Interesting. Very good. Well, I but do. Yeah, pre- it sounds like he has had the experience. Like that sounds really genuine to me. So he's he he really is. He's uh he's been on mission. He has been uh been doing this, and so it's not a it's not a ploy. It's not a, a farce. It's a it's a, he's. It sounds like he really was growing up Mormon. And from what I understand, at, at first clip. It sounded like what he was about to say was that I'm fifth generation Mormon, but he said I'm fifth generation from Utah. That could mean anything, but I, I thought that was interesting too. That he's 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 been here and he's been around the area for quite a while. So that plays into into this whole thing a little bit. Well, as we get into it, but what in the world is so? My my question, of course, was what in the world was a. Uh, a Mormon gentleman who at least believes in Jesus Christ and and uh, believes in mission going on and helping people. I I, I think um, I don't agree with everything in the LDS Church, but I do agree with going two by two. I think that's very important, and I, I believe that um, you do have a service mind. And I, I think it's fascinating that that he decided to own Skinwalker Ranch, some of the most spiritualism areas in the United States, and so. I want to kind of dig into that a little bit more, and and he talks about that things that uh, that made him decide to buy this. And he's going to go into a little bit of his backstory and what's going on. Let's let's dig into it. Let's see, about thirteen years ago, I was funding an advanced physics effort. Uh, we'd actually transformed a a large percentage of our of our hangar facility of our family's aviation uh, management and hangar facility at the Provo Airport into an engineering lab testing physics theories dealing with gravitational physics. Uh, It was an interesting effort, was something I did not publicize. So I had a a client that I represented back in the mid-90s that was a, a genius software development executive that ended up forming a a company that became the world's leading internet consulting firm. And he he left that firm ultimately uh, to fund efforts relative to the UFO phenomena. Uh, He had claimed that he had his own experience, had been visited. I found it all to be quite unbelievable, but I could not uh, deny his success in business. I'd had the privilege of negotiating his first headquarters transaction and, uh, and, and working with him at a young age. Through that experience, 
I developed relationships with a team of science advisors that, unbeknownst to me, were simultaneously advising an elusive billionaire out of Las Vegas named Robert Bigelow of Bigelow Aerospace. Well, they, they proceeded to say, well, Brandon, there's a lot more going on that meets the eye, and you as a, as a real estate mogul and advisor in the Intermountain West, you know, uh, seem to be a potential fit to joint venture or at least have a discussion with Mr. Bigelow. And I, I agreed. I, I, I jumped at the chance to at least have a meeting, to have a discussion, flew down to Las Vegas and found myself at Mr. Bigelow's uh, Bigelow Aerospace Compound, which is the closest thing to a James Bond villain lair that I've ever seen. I mean, it's a it's an incredible facility. I mean, huge buildings that house full size space stations and space habitats that have been designed where they're 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 doing the materials science and the life safety uh, testing and uh, and engineering to to really position Bigelow Aerospace at least at the time to be the real estate development company of space. Wow. And uh, Mr. Bigelow uh, had an interest in, in potentially selling the, the Utah property. He had expressed, uh, he had expressed not only willingness to consider the sale, but the, the fact that he was very busy and occupied with uh, you know, negotiating deals with SpaceX and NASA and others. Uh, you know, playing a key role in the private space race. Uh, we we had a great visit, and I think developed a good relationship. I I told him that I was a skeptic, that I'd never seen a UFO or a ghost or orb or anything of the sort, and that I would be bringing in my own team. I also asked him for any of the data, uh, and he said, well, I'm, I'm selling the property on an as-is basis. I'm not willing to turn over any data, not only because... The ranch was part of a Pentagon-funded black budget program between 2007 and 2013. But he he went on to say that he felt you know that he wanted to keep that that private, and I agreed. At the time, I was led to believe that it was simply because Mr. Bigelow was just buried, was very busy with with you know, getting his his B modules and his space habitats up in orbit and ultimately on the moon and Mars, which I believe was true. But also, I've learned he ascribed negative events afflicting his family to really his ownership of the ranch. Really? Uh, Mr. Bigelow uh, blamed the ranch for dark, disturbing events that happened in their lives, and it's not my story to tell. It's been told by others in the media and advisors, but uh, uh, owning the ranch was not a positive experience for him. You, even before him, though, this went back to Native American tribes. I mean, even in in the show, yeah. you know, I, I believe he, correct me if I'm wrong, are they hydroglyphs? Is that what you call them? Petroglyphs. So petroglyphs. there's rock art. There's, you know, we have a, 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 a megalithic site there uh, uh, as well that we've investigated in the area. Uh, but there's a lot of rock art and, and evidence of, of the ancients, of the, the Native Americans uh, working on the property. There's also a strange Masonic symbol that is etched into the, the face of the Mesa that many have, many have uh, claimed symbolizes as above, so below. I was also surprised to find that on the perimeter fence line, there were animal body parts. There were, there were animal bladders hanging from the fence line when I was first shown the property uh, by exiting Bigelow Security. And I asked the security, I said, what, what is the nature of, what the hell? Is that what? Why? Why are those things hanging from the fence line, perimeter of the property? And and the security at the time looked at me 
with a straight face and said, look, the Native American neighbors that surround this property place these animal bladders on the fence line and bless them to keep the demonic spirits and entities inside this property and off of their property. And I, I quickly learned that the tribal leaders in the Uinta Basin and surrounding the property had been telling their people not to even look the way of the ranch, that they were, they were told, don't even look the way of the property or else you may have demonic forces, entities that would follow you. Anyways, we find our... All right, let's, let's pause it right there just for a second. Wow. Wow. Okay, so this is how he got started. He, uh, let me just recap real quick. 13 years he ago, he began finding uh, an effort. Uh, he, he was helping out someone he knew in physics who connected him to some research scientists who were also helping out Bigelow. Bigelow uh, uh, talked to him and said, hey, uh, you want to buy this from me? I, I don't want this thing anymore. Uh, I, I'm not telling you why. <laughs> <laughs> because it was causing him some trouble. Uh, and and keep in mind, people think that these things are, are benevolent ent entities. Yeah, and, and people want to get rid of this property. Hmm, you wonder. And, and then, um, so then he said there's some strange Masonic signs. Masonic signs? I had no, no idea that the Masonic sign was as above, so below. I've heard that over and over and over again as researching this topic the as above, so below, and that I had the GPT it real quick. I just want to see what GPT says uh, before I go on to see what you guys say. But this is what uh, GPT says. It says, uh, yeah, the phrase as above, so oh, let me, let me go back, back up. What does the phrase as above, so, so below mean? As above, so below, let's see what GPT says, is a phrase with roots in ancient philosophy, particularly hermeticism, or Hermes, I guess, and uh, alchemy, we're forging a metal. Uh, it, uh, it encapsulates the idea that the, the universe or, its, or the divine mirrors the microcosm uh, and, and vice versa. The concept suggests that patterns, principles, and structures found in the larger universe are reflected in smaller systems. And what happens on one level is reflected on another. The practical terms, it implies that the laws governing the cosmos are also governing human life. Well, I mean, at, at first glance, it seems, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I believe as a Christian that that uh, the cosmos is governed by God and it's also govern, governing the universe. But what 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 the, what's the tie to spiritualism here? Let's go and ask it a little bit further. Says, yeah. The t I said, is, is there any tie to the occult? Says, yes. The phrase, as above, so below, does have ties to the occult, particularly through its association with, um, yeah, Hermes and alchemy, which are of themselves often considered occultic and esoteric traditions. There you go. The, the occultism, the phrase is often used to convey the idea of interconnectedness. You know, we're, we're all one, all one, Mother uh, uh, Earth and all this other stuff, Father Time and all this other pagan ideas. As above, so below is sometimes used in the occult circles to emphasize the idea that the understanding of microcosm of the universe. So it's it's all occultism. It's saying the exact same thing. It's just saying, hey, yeah, look, uh, this is occultic. It's it's essentially what, what it's saying. Uh, I see, I heard Matthew typing ferociously while I'm, I was reading. I'm sure you have something fascinating to say. I'm going to go to Matthew first, uh, David, unless... Uh, unless you have something to say real quick, but I, I, I think Matthew might have something <laughs> for us. My typing, give it away that, yeah. that easily? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll mute my microphone next time. I don't want to type over you. Um, yes, I was. I was typing because we'd actually brought up this saying before because it, it does come up in the occult circles and there's some weirdos who uh, do spout the phrase. But would it interest you to know that that phrase, as above, so below, actually can be found in a certain Bible translation? <laughs> Wild, right? Because we had talked about it, and then somebody commented, I was in the live chat or the comment section, they said, you don't know what you're talking about, as above, so below, that's a biblical concept, it's in the Bible. 
I was shocked. I'm like, I've never heard that phrase in the Bible. Well, sure enough, I had to look it up and do a little digging, and it's found in The Message, which I don't know if uh, you're familiar with The Message or what that is. <laughs> It, it's a. <laughs> it was. It's one of the more modern Bible translations. It. Who, oh man! It aimed to uh, bring the, the the Bible into more of layman's terms. So it's kind of the idea <laughs> behind it. Uh, but really, it, it's not putting it in layman's terms. It's sneaking in these weird ideas where they don't belong. And and Je- when Jesus. Uh, says, you know, that you'll pray in this matter. Uh, and he says, you know, Father who art in heaven, uh, What's give the us verse? Day our daily bread. This is uh, Matthew 6.10 specifically from that, uh, that prayer model that Jesus gave. Rather than, um, oh, cool, so you got all the different ones here. From, in, the K, in the KJV, it's the version I read. It's, thy kingdom done, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. But the message changes it up, and it says, Set the world right, do what's best, as above, so below. My goodness. <clears throat> I mean... Why is that significant? Well, we've just seen that in this occult concept, it's there's a give and a take, that what is happening above is reflected below, and what's happening below is reflected above, and there's this kind of like almost spiritual jazz that's happening, right? A little a back and forth there, but that's not what Jesus is is telling us to pray for. In heaven, we have a, uh, it's an area where the devil has been thrown out of. It was once a place where there was rebellion, but God removed the rebellious elements from heaven, and there is now, it's now a holy place. Satan is down here living amongst us along with his fallen angels. So when we ask, for thy kingdom come, thy will in earth as it is in heaven. We're asking for earth to be made more of a heavenly place. Not that we want as above, so below. And in saying that, we're embracing this dual nature where we're also saying what happens here is reflected there and what's happened there is reflected here. It's it's a very different message uh, in the message. But uh, um, among that discrepancy there's other things i mean they they make uh people who are just making uh you know profound statements they'll change it around so they're cursing they're saying like listen here like instead of being like a den of vipers uh, it'll be like listen here you sobs you know like that's it's like no oh, hold up <laughs> it's it just totally um diminishes the power of the word and, and what's happening there but uh, that's, that's another funny. way that it does by sneaking in an concept, so fascinating, fascinating. I, yes. I wanted to ask you, David. Is there a lot of? I, I find it interesting that they connected this to masonry. Is there a lot of masons in in Utah? I'm not aware, to be honest. Why there would maybe there may not be? Yeah, why would it be? I know etched? Joseph Smith has some connections with masonry, but mm-hmm. part of a mason. It's not lot, often which... spoken about. He did, yeah. I wonder why it would be etched in the side of the the cliff, or or uh, what do they call it? The um, the side of the, uh, the the thing there, as above, so below. It makes me think that there's some kind of uh, ritual that has been happening here. I've never heard of the phrase before, so mm-hmm. it's new to me. Interesting. Well, they he said it was linked that. Th- it was a symbol that's linked to that phrase. So if you're looking at uh, masonry, I imagine it's like the compass in the square, right? Because it has a triangular, it's kind of going up and it's going down. Another way that it's represented is someone will point a finger up and someone will point a finger down. Uh, we see that in the Baphomet statue, for example. That's a, a, an embodiment of that phrase. Ah, but when, okay. he, so he's, when he says it's a Freemason symbol, I thought that was weird too because he's talking about how there's all these Native American symbols and then he just says, oh yeah, there's also these like Freemason symbols and Freemasonry and like, the uh, ancient Native Americans, <laughs> they're uh, cultures uh, apart, they're ocean apart and mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> hundreds, thousands of years apart. Uh, so that just doesn't make sense to me unless he, you're just seeing things that are and this happens i mean look into it if people think the swastika is like some type of a new nazi invention no it's not you know hitler was embracing occultism by using the swastika and it could be found all over the world it could be found in japan 
on island nation, totally isolationist. Boom, they got swastikas there. Go and look at some of the temples down in uh, the ancient Mayans. They got swastikas down there. How does that happen? Unless there is a prevailing spirit that is leading people into uh, embracing these symbols. You know, I found, though, while I was in the, I, I, I did the China, I went there in 2014, and I was looking at all the different temples. It was like a, a temple tour, uh, practically, we went on. I was like, why are, we, why are we back at another temple? And I kept seeing these swastikas, except they were backwards. You know how the pinwheel goes a certain way? I forget which way it is, but the pinwheel would actually go the opposite way. And someone pointed that out to me. I was like, oh, okay, well, that is interesting. I wonder why it's the opposite way for... Um, for them, but it's still it's still recognized as the same thing. So I, I think it's interesting yeah. that that's that is that way. I want to point that out in case I know somebody somewhere is going to make that comment. So yeah, we know it's backwards, but um, it is interesting that it's from that Eastern religion, and it's been brought over. It's fascinating to yeah. me. I, I think it's a inter international almost because there are some things where yes, it can be seen prevalently in Eastern mysticism, maybe in the modern day. What I'm saying is even these cultures that had no, you know, known connections to these religious systems, still somehow the symbolism is, is brought back again. Mm -hmm. so, so make of that what you will. So what, what's really fascinating about this is the Indian tribes that surround this area. And uh, I, I wanted to ask, um, also I wanted to ask you, David, if you know of anything about the Indian tribes that surround a Utah area. I, I not very prevalent in our area, so yeah. I didn't know either. I didn't so know much about Native Americans. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know if it's Navajo or, or a, a Aztec or whatever they are, but um, fascinating that they seem to know more about this place than, than the Bigelow himself. Because there's like they've had some experiences. Yeah. I mean if they said, Yeah, don't even look at that place because we want to keep the demons over there. Wow, that's saying something. Wow. What do you what do you make of that whole thing where the place is cursed? What do you guys think about that? When someone says, oh, this is like cursed ground, and he's saying, I've had bad experiences in my life from owning this property. What, what do you guys make of that? You know, I, uh, old me uh, doesn't take to uh, curses as a very big deal. But I think also that's also because we're in a an age, a generation where spiritualism isn't very prevalent, especially here in the U.S. Um, I do think that there is something to uh, physical objects having ties to spiritualism. Just as we see the, the Garden of Eden, uh, there was a tree, and God said, you have to stay at this location. And there's also other things... Um, uh, that uh, I often refer to Roger Morneau that talks about, hey, if you got things in your house that are tied to the occult, you got to get them out because they have access to that stuff and they're allowed to uh, to torment you. Things like that. I don't know. I think we're going to know more as time goes on. Do you have any thoughts on it, David? Half of me wants to say that this is some kind of marketing ploy because he is in real estate trying to <laughs> build up the mystique of this demon alien area you know mm -hmm. the other half of me um you know the bible does talk about the wilderness jesus went to be tempted there um That's i guess there are some good verses about the wilderness um about a voice calling out in the wilderness referring to john the baptist um, i don't know i'm just trying to think about verses that involve the wilderness <laughs> Yeah, I I think the the fact that everybody is saying this place is possessed and it's evil and I got to get rid of it. Say you're uh you're these fallen eight, some demonic entities, right? And you've been messing with this guy who owns it, and he's been providing this information to the government, doing whatever deals. Everything's going good. You like it, but uh, then you get the orders, marching orders. Hey, we need to change it up. You know, we've done enough here. They've done five years' worth of research. It's time for this property to change hands. It's time to get a new ownership in here. So uh, start weighing on this guy. You know, make his life hell to the point where he <laughs> wants to sell this, and it retains its mystique that way, like you're saying. I think that this guy being in real estate, obviously, if he as a human being can recognize that there is some type of mystique and allure to a, ooh, a haunted property... 
those those angelic intelligences know it better than him. They're saying, oh yeah, drum it up, drum up the suspicion, get him to sell it, and we're going to change gears. We're going to go this direction now. And not only that, but think about this. So you have all this terrible demonic occult activity, and what are these poor neighbors doing to try to prevent mm. it from happening? They're not calling on Jesus. They're not reaching out to God for help and protection. No, they're doing witchcraft to try to combat evil spirits. So it's just like, it's like a cycle, you know? It just feeds itself. It'd be like, uh, you know, if I saw a massive fire, and I'm like, uh-oh, a fire. I need to put that fire out. Let me grab the nearest liquid and I grab the can of gasoline and I start throwing, throwing gas it. on the fire. Yeah, you know, that's that's not going to do anything. That's not going to put it out. But uh, it's just it seems to be a bad situation there from yeah. what he's describing. Part of me wants to think this is just some kind of psyop. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, go for it. Oh, part of me wants to say it's just a psyop that they're like Matthew is trying to say like build up the mystique and stuff. But the other half of me does recognize that the adversary is real and he does you know, mess with our minds. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of torn which way is the correct way to think about it. It is, it is. And I like the idea that what Matthew said, or, or I forget who it was, Matthew or you, David, said that this, you know, he's a real estate guy. And he's also promoting a video <laughs> on, on. but, but that, I, I, mean, I take that back because he's, uh, later on he's going to tell us that all the money that comes from this Hollywood uh, fame is going to uh, a nonprofit. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Well, I will say this as a last note before we go to the next clip. If it is a psyop, if it's all a lie, and this is a man-made type of uh, construct, what does that mean still, right? Mm -hmm. Who's the father of all lies? Right. Who is the – who provi gives man that spirit and uh, makes them feel powerful through mm -hmm. lying and manipulating their fellow yeah. man. That's still Satan. That's why I've always said, you don't want to go to a fortune teller, right? Because <laughs> there's other two options. One, they're actually demonically possessed. They've got familiar spirits that they're conversing with, and there is some type of uh, demonic power there. Or they're a charlatan, they're lying, and they just want to take your money, which is, yeah. it's just still evil. So either way, whether this is something real that's happening or this is drummed up, manufactured, to me, it's it's evil, evil and evil. So, either side of the coin, and the devil's laughing either way. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, speaking of all that, what, let's see exactly what he's discovered here, and, and dig into some of the stories behind it, because I want to know what exactly what Brandon has seen while he's been there, because apparently he's drumming up all this stuff, and you won't believe. <laughs> you wouldn't believe some of the acronyms that he gives some of this stuff as he's trying to understand what's going on. Watch this. I was also receiving calls through Jim Morse and Thomas Winterton from producers of the History Channel wanting to meet with the owner to discuss a docu-series. Anyways, we find ourselves out at Homestead 2. Smartphone malfunctioning. Everyone's feeling these physical effects. My brother's are feeling uneasy enough that they want to leave, and they leave. They're, they're happier driving and sitting at the airport for hours until I tell them that we're ready to fly back. And, uh, and I'm finding the whole thing interesting. Well, as we're, as we're all discussing kind of the history of Skinwalker Ranch and the homesteads, you know, we proceed to kind of get our phones out to take some pictures. I felt like it was a good photo opportunity. And lo and behold, my phone's dead. It had previously been at 80% charge. My phone's completely dead. Eric Bard's phone that had recorded that where he had screen captured the, uh, the anomaly, the, the strange colors and flashing was dead. The others' phones were dead. So we, you know, we didn't have our, our cameras. So I thought, darn, well, we better go take them back to, to the ranch house and plug them in and let them charge up. But we don't want to disrupt our day because of it. It was very frustrating. And so we took the phones back, put them in chargers, and then we proceeded to, to return back out to the old homesteads. This time we drove all the way back out to Homestead 3, 
which is beyond Homestead Two, and it's a single structure. It's 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 uh, it's pretty haunting looking. And uh, we pull up around the backside of the structure. This is October, October fourteenth uh, of twenty sixteen, and we all pile out and we all walk around the other side. And again, we're looking at the landscape and everyone's visiting and having a good experience. I mean, my brothers have returned, have left and returned to the airport awaiting a call, you know, hours later. And, uh, and we're just visiting. And after about 10 minutes, I ask, well, where's, where's George, the big guy, the, the security, uh, the six foot six security, um, professional that, uh, that was there was, wasn't present and for some reason, uh, we kind of lost track of him. And everyone said, well, when we all, when we all piled out of the, uh, the open-air Polaris you know, UTV, the Ranger, you know, no one really paid attention. I said, well, let me go try to find him. So I proceed to walk around to the back of the, uh, the homestead, Homestead 3, to find George. And right as I'm coming around the corner in this, this grass area where we'd parked it, and the the vehicle being off in the distance, it was as if something cupped my ears. It was all of the all of my hearing was was impacted. It was as if I walked into a into a soundproof room. If you ever been into an anechoic chamber or a soundproof room, I have. and that sensation, the only, the only thing you can do to simulate it right now is by by you know, cupping your ears. It's like a frequency change. Yeah, all of the ambient noise disappears. And I thought it was the strangest thing. It was the strangest sensation. And then I see, off in the distance, standing fully upright, this six-foot-six giant of a man in the back of this UTV. And I thought, that's odd. So I yell his name, George. And I can hear, kind of muffled. It's almost like yelling underwater. I thought that was strange. And I, I proceed to, to walk to get closer and he's not responding. And as I near the vehicle and shout his name again, he's, he's standing upright with his eyes closed. And right as I'm nearing the vehicle, all of the ambient noise, all of the sound comes back, is, is restored. And as I yell his name again, his eyes fluttered open. And he looked down at me and uh, I said, what's going on? something happened? What, what's going on? And he said, well, that was weird. And I, I asked him, I said, what was weird? What, what is weird? And he, he says, well, when you all jumped out, when you pulled up and you, all, you stopped the vehicle and you all jumped out, I stood up and found myself paralyzed. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. And then everything went black. And he asked, how long have I been, how long have I been here? And I said, about 10 minutes. And he just shook his head, was, was obviously disturbed. I asked him, I said, has this ever happened to you in your life? Have you ever had this experience? And he said, no, I've never experienced anything like this. 10 minutes wow. had passed. Who knows what happened, but he he felt odd. He expressed the fact that he felt a little bit off, and uh, and we proceeded to gather everyone up and uh, and jump back in the vehicles. And so as we're we're going back to retrieve our phones to have our cameras, we're driving on that dirt road at the base of the mesa. You know that main road that you see on the docu series that runs east west on the property. And as we're about halfway back to Homestead One, or the ranch house, or the command center, as we now call it, the other security professional in the back starts shouting, stop the vehicle, stop the vehicle. And I'm driving, I'm just trucking along, driving this little Polaris UTV. And I look back and he's waving his hands, pointing up ahead. So I, I, I bring the vehicle to a stop. And he's just shouting. He says, look at that, look at that. And sure enough, I look right where he's pointing, right ahead of us, right above the mesa, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 
on October 14th, and there is a 40, 50 foot long silver grayish disc-like object. What can only be described as a flying saucer. And it's just sitting there in, in broad daylight, clear as day, right above the mesa. Probably about 100, 100 feet above the mesa or so. And we're all sitting there astonished. I'm like, you guys see that? And he's like, yeah, that's what I, I was trying to get you to stop, stop the vehicle. Within a couple of seconds, it changes position. It literally blinked from one position to another. Either it moved with split second speed or it was able to, to change position through some other means, but it moves about 50 feet to the left or to the north. We all, like it appeared 50 feet to well, the left, or you actually darted, saw it, it move? It was like in the blink of an eye, it could change position and move that quickly. We all sat there astonished. And said, well, did you see that? Seconds later, it drops to just kind of a low hover above the mesa. It, it literally changes position and drops right above the mesa. Still sitting there, clear as day. It was almost like a video game. It, looked, it was surreal. And then within a few seconds later, it darts to the right. We're all, with every movement, we're gasping. We're saying, are you watching this? Do you see this? And then within about 20 seconds from the start of the event, it is gone. It, either, it, it appeared that it either went to a dot as if it were darting off into the distance at split second speed, or it was literally phasing out of our perception instantaneously. Uh, but it was gone. And that whole event spanning about 20 seconds that I saw right in front of us with multiple witnesses at my side that I had not met before that day that had professed the same skepticism that morning sat there changed forever. In that moment, Sean, I went from being an open-minded skeptic to an experiencer. It wasn't, it wasn't about belief. It was undeniable. It was fact. What we saw was real. Oh, man. So I took a lot of notes while we were, he was talking because... That was interesting. David, you said you, you look like you have something to say immediately. You were, I do. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> I can wait. Yeah, you can say what you have to say. It's fine. No, no, no. I, I have things to say okay. too, but I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I can't decide whether this guy's a dupe or a knave, but I will comment with a scripture if that's all right. Yeah, I do it. Yeah, it's, uh, this is Matthew 4, uh, 24, of course. For there shall arise false messiahs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders so that if it can be, they will come to lead astray the chosen. If therefore they say to you, Behold, he is in the desert or wilderness, do not go out to see. Or if they shall say, Behold, he is in the if he is in the inner rooms, don't believe it. One hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred. So it sounds like he's describing some kind of miraculous sign out in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Interesting. Just to mind. Huh. And and not only that, the, the the sign that he saw in the sky, and they said that it changed them forever. And we've seen this where well, they've said this before. It changes you when you see the something like this. But not only that, something physically is happening. So they said that they have a six foot six a security officer, uh, and they didn't say this. Uh, I don't think it's come out yet, or I don't know if I included it. But they they call him the dragon. <laughs> can't make this stuff up. So so the dragon is sitting there, from what I can see, completely possessed, perfect possession. I mean, it's the exact same thing that's happening when you when Marneau talks about it. Roger Marneau, uh, he said he was in the, the, the satanic church, and he, they had these people that went into possession. Their eyes would flutter closed, they would be able to all of a sudden shiver a little bit, and then they would be awake and talking to someone else. But this type of possession, he didn't awaken and talk in, in a different way. He, but this explains a lot of the different lore that happens in ufology. If you are taken over by a being, and, and, and I'm, I'm, telling, I'm talking to Christians right now. This is demonic. 
I'm talking to ufologists right now. Whatever you want to believe this is, it's not good. And when, you, when it decides it wants to take over your own body, there's nothing malevolent about that. And so you have this huge guy, and he's got uh, time manipulation, right? Because he completely loses track of being conscious. He, he can be moved to a new location. We see that in the lore where people wake up inside fields somewhere away from their vehicle. And so they're like, I don't know, I was transported. No, you weren't. You were, you were uh, possessed. That's what happened. Then you got paralysis, which is exactly what happens. The guy couldn't move, right? And uh, I, th- I find it interesting. The new thing I've heard is the ear cupping thing. I haven't heard that before. Somehow something happened to his ears. The other guy, uh, this guy, Brandon, actually. And, um, and then he also asked the same thing, the six foot six guy. How long have I been here? Same thing that happened in Roger Marneau. I wish I had concluded that clip now. He said, how long have I been out when they woke up? How long have I been out? fascinating. All exactly the same thing was happening here. It was perfect possession. That's, that's essentially what happened here. And it changes you forever. That's all I wanted to say about this. Matthew, you have any thoughts? What I, what I also oh. found interesting was, um, sorry, I'll let Matthew speak. No, 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 it's okay. Go for it. No, and no, then go ahead. We'll I'll go. What you have to say. So his description um, about this demonic force or whatever, you know, Joseph Smith also described like being attacked by a, a dark power that was trying to bind him, bind his tongue. He couldn't move. Uh, that just came to mind from my Mormon background. Is but, that from the? Um, is that from uh, stories verbally, or is that in one of your uh, one of you know like Pearl um, Great Price or whatever it is? There's like three different. There's three different versions or accounts of the first vision that Joseph Smith had, and in one of them, he says that he was attacked by a dark force before he he saw the light come down and speak to him and all of that. You know, uh, you know, another prophet had a similar experience that you're describing there. First, it was bad, and then it became good. That's the prophet Muhammad. He was uh, being tormented, and he thought it was a demonic thing. But it was uh, the people when he came back and talked to them was the people around him that said, "Oh no, no, this is uh, Gabriel. This is a, this is a good thing. You need to listen to the, this this entity, and embrace it." And uh, it says, uh, "It's like this is according to their own book." that Muhammad was, like, suicidal from dealing with this entity. He wanted to throw himself off of the cliffs, and it would come to him and just bring him back from the edge time and time again. So, yeah, there's this weird... Uh, and it happened down the wilderness, didn't it? Yeah, it sure did. <laughs> and, for uh, Muhammad yeah, and for just, Joseph Smith. Huh. Yeah, well, yeah, down well, the wilderness. Uh, yeah, and, w- and what I find uh, about that is that whenever we read in the Bible, you know, like... Um, I was reading over Isaiah, for example, um, and Isaiah has this this moment where he, he realizes, he's like, whoa, I am a, a man of unclean lips amongst an unclean people, and it's just, it's such a heavy moment, but what happens? It's like, yeah, he's feeling bad, obviously, because it's like he's, he's confronted with his own guilt and his own... Uh, conscience. He's saying, I, I'm sinning again. I've sinned against God. I'm part of this, like, uh, this whole body of people who are turning against you. And, and God gives him reassurance. An angel comes and touches the coal to his lips and says, there, I've made you clean. You know, I'm, ta- I'm taking away your sin. You're, you're going to be okay. Don't just remain in this manic state and being upset. Like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm coming and I'm going to pick you up. And, uh, you're not going to have this, this weird, weirdness, uh, necessarily like, external um, oppression that's happening there. And uh, <coughs> we're talking about possessed people, so uh, in Mark, the first chapter of Mark, uh, you see uh, there's a Jesus' teaching in the synagogue, and it says that there's a man with an unclean spirit there, and it cries out saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And then Jesus rebukes this unclean spirit within the man. But think about that. This guy, prior to it, he had this unclean spirit in him, but he's going to the synagogue. He's just going about his business. And, you know, this is any other day for me. Woke up, ate my breakfast, doing whatever, my stuff. All right, time to go over to the synagogue. I'm going, you know, walking of your own agency. And then all of a sudden, there's an event, and that spirit seizes the man. And it, it, it grabs control of him. So in that same way, this uh, the security guy, I'm sure he just showed up to work any other day, but if he's got this unclean spirit within him, 
it, it could be triggered and brought on. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the unclean spirit in that man when I saw Jesus was just terrified of Jesus. But this unclean spirit that was in the security guard could be playing along. And like I say, I do believe that the angels, to me, they seem more in line with a military order. You know, they have a, he's like a, the God, the host of angel armies, right? It's like even uh, Jesus says when he's seized in the garden, you know, I think I cannot pray the, the father now. And he would send me like a thousand angels to come by my side. It's like he could bring in the, the reinforcements whenever he wants. And I think that Satan understands that and understands their role. And they still have a hierarchical kind of relationship. It's just now they put Satan as the top dog and it's disseminated these orders. So if you have like an agent, say, out in the field and he's in the security guard and it's like, all right, your your time to shine is today. Like you grab hold of him and we're going to, it's showtime because we're doing the, the big one. And we're, we're, we're making converts here today because we're going to turn these skeptics into experiencers. Very fascinating. I want to I want to go to the chat real I'm, quick. I'm fascinated. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I just want to say one thing in the chat. Uh, Lisa, I won't say your last name if you don't want to be doxxed through the YouTube channel, but uh, Lisa has been a, a, a follower, and she's chatted with us quite a bit. She's in the Discord. And um, she says that ear cupping thing, and it just got away from me. There it is. Ear cupping thing I've heard a lot of my veteran uh, Vietnam veterans talk about. So this is something that's that's really interesting. She's heard that this this is something I haven't heard before, at least not in the lore. And so the ear cupping thing is an issue. Might not be spiritual, maybe wonder, it is. I wonder I if it's know. like like a tinnitus type of a thing. Maybe I get tinnitus sometimes. It's really annoying. It's just like a high pitched frequency in my right ear, and I'll ring. It's like I don't think I'm being demonically possessed or oppressed in that moment. I think my ears just mess up. I got bad sinuses. <laughs> it's all <laughs> interconnected. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I I could see that would be creepy if that was happening to me. And uh, there's also other weird stuff happening. What are you gonna say? Oh, Dave? she's talking about how it's people in the jungle. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Go on, David. I want to hear what you have to say. I just want to reiterate that I am just fascinated that all of these things happen out in the wilderness. And, yeah. you know, Jesus couldn't be more clear. He says, follow them not. Like, do you have any ideas on why the adversary prefers to do these things out in the wilderness as opposed to, like, in the city or an urban area? Mm. you mm. have any ideas on that? I guess I, I don't know. That is an interesting one. I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they, uh, <sighs> I don't know. That's a good question. Why is it always out in the middle of nowhere? Because I, I think that there's, there's always more going on inside the city. There's a lot of more people, a lot more to maybe possess, lots to do, lots to make sure that people are following their way of doing things. Maybe there's just less to do out there <laughs> so they can find more maybe, creative ways. I don't know. Well, maybe it also has to do with less of a reliance on um, civilization and the people around you. I don't necessarily know if the wilderness itself is something we need to always avoid, uh, but I think it could be a place where the enemy has an opportunity to come in at you. Because think about Exodus, right? The Israelites were being led through the wilderness there. And even that whole, uh, the generation, basically that wouldn't enter into the promised land, said, okay, we're gonna, you're going back in for another 40 years. You come back and we're going to try again. Well, Jesus went into the wilderness 40 days, 40 nights. There is an aspect of when you're in the wilderness, that's where... Um, it's, it's almost like you're being tried. You're, it's, it's tough. It's, it's tough physically because food is not readily available as it is in civilization. The comforts of a roof and uh, clean clothes and all of that stuff that goes with being around a, a population center. But also from a spiritual standpoint because where uh, you know Jesus was sending people out, like we said earlier, two by two, like there's an example of you're, you're with each other and there's a communal aspect there. You take that away... Suddenly it's like, okay, what are you going to do? Who are you going to rely on? I think if you have a good relationship with God, the wilderness doesn't need to be something we're afraid of. Take Elijah, for example. What happened to Elijah when he was being oppressed? He went into the wilderness and he hid there. And God fed him with the ravens. And God led him to the widow and the son and, and fed him through that way. But there was a portion of time where he's just out there in the wilderness. But he has this relationship with God. He has a reliance on God. And he's not in danger. And I think that's... 
what we need to embrace. And like you're saying, Jesus is saying, if there's something happening out there and you know something evil is happening out in the wilderness, don't go there. <laughs> That's just sound <laughs> advice. We don't need to put God to the test necessarily. We don't need to go um, into these dark places. Skinwalker Ranch, I, mean, I don't need to go out there and, you know, touch up on the animal bones and the organs or whatever. Yeah, it's, I know what's happening out there. To me, it's pretty clear. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's about... Who, who do you rely on ultimately? And that's what the wilderness experience uh, can be indicative of. Absolutely. I liked, well, your, I liked your explanation. Yeah, and I, I want to also comment, um, the who was it here? Yes, Meredith Poole says, isolation is so impactful on the mind. And I think that's uh, another important aspect to this whole thing. Isolation is impactful on the mind. And uh, it, it will... Uh, it will affect you. You will realize more things when you have quietness and it's not constant sirens and people talking and all this other stuff that's happening in the cities. Um, well, uh, here, uh, Jeff in the chat also mentioned, here's another good example. Moses was in the wilderness when uh, when he, you know, spoke with God the first time, saw the burning bush. There you have it. Another good experience in the wilderness. Uh, Abraham and Isaac, they went out into the wilderness I just thought of that one. There's a couple of different examples, mm -hmm. but I do think I like that you're bringing up the significance of the wilderness mm -hmm. because it really is. There is, uh, there's an important aspect to it. And the fact that Skinwalker Ranch, like you're saying, to tie it into this subject, it's a remote place. Yeah, you know, it is. It's a, it's a wild place and the homesteads, the abandoned aspect of it. It's creepy. I bet. Yeah. Regardless. <laughs> The uh, I think uh, Galilee was in the wilderness. It was actually away from the city, the main part of everything. Uh, and people said, "What good can come out of Ga Galilee?" Uh, and people would, uh, and I think even it's said, I can't pull this out of my hat here, but it is said that Noah, when he was building the ark, he was actually building it away from everything else as he was building it. And people said, "What in the world are you doing building an ark in the mountains?" You know, so I, 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 it, I think it's interesting that there's, there's a lot to do with the wilderness and, uh, and spirituality, both good and bad. And so, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, speaking of all this uh, that's happening inside the city and outside the city, we have something that actually pulls the city straight into, into our living rooms every single day, which I try to get rid of. Hollywood. Hollywood uh, got a hold of Brandon. And uh, they want to talk about this from their perspective. And Brandon said, absolutely not. Check this out. I was also receiving calls through Jim Morse and Thomas Winterton from producers of the History Channel wanting to meet with the owner to discuss a docu-series. The ability to come in and document the events occurring on this, this piece of property. Word was starting to get out that... Uh, that there was an ongoing investigation. There were photos that uh, were leaked online that showed that there was a security presence there and that there was a very sophisticated effort. And uh, producers of the History Channel were hell-bent on getting an audience with whoever this mysterious owner was in order to pitch the opportunity to, to have a docu-series effort that would record and document what was happening on a day-to-day -day basis. They reached out for over a year. So for over a year on a weekly basis, I was being hounded by my people to at least consider potentially responding to the phone calls. And after a year, I reluctantly agreed to the meeting subject to a confidentiality agreement being signed by everyone. Producers flew in. We had a discussion. I said, number one, condition. If I were to if I were to consider this number one, it has to be true. Nothing can be faked, manipulated, or contrived. I have no interest in being part of some ghost hunters type effort with a bunch of guys tripping over themselves in the dark with night vision. This has to be true. And I have to have final cut on everything if we were to do anything. Number two you have to use my team. We're not having any Hollywood casting call. We're not bringing in individuals from the outside that could potentially compromise 
the integrity of the scientific investigation that I've been privately funding to the tune of millions of dollars up until that point. And number three was that my identity needed to remain confidential. I had no interest in being on television. I didn't want my name associated with it. Again, even my family at the time had no idea that I owned the ranch, along with business partners and others. Why, why were you so hell-bent on, being, on everything being confidential? I did not want my ownership of this property or the topics associated with Skinwalker Ranch to in any way divert from or compromise or undermine my professional endeavors. I'm going to pause it there because he goes on for the next 60 seconds and talks about how he says the same thing over and over and over again for the next, for the next full minute. But um, I, he was absolutely sure that he did not want... Imagine having so much money that you don't have to tell your family that <laughs> you own a property full of demons. I, I, that blew my mind when I first heard that. Hey, by the way, I'm doing research on, on uh, demons on this property in Utah. Mm, you don't know about it. <laughs> what? So uh, what he said there was that um, was really fascinating to me because Hollywood wants to come in here and make, make a buck off of it. Of course, people are interested in this stuff. They're going to do it. But they came in here and they said, um, he said, okay, yeah, you can come in here, but you're using my team. There's going to be no actors. This is no false story. Anything that happens is going to be true. It makes me really wonder what the show was they were filming. I'm sure people know here in the comments. I don't. I don't watch this stuff. I'm trying to find out the facts from the actual people involved and uh, and, and actually hear it and uh, understand it through the... You can see us. And I'll continue yeah. on. Okay. You're good. Look, looks good? Okay, good. All right, very good. Um, I have gotten nobody. Nobody responding yet. Okay, maybe it's just me. But uh, uh, Hollywood, uh, it just continue as if it's uh, working. I hope it's working. Uh, I think that's interesting. And I think uh, that him uh, not wanting to share his identity initially uh, uh, says, that, you know, hey, you know, this is this is something that I want to keep secret. I want to understand. And I'm wondering if he's getting, if he's coming at this through either a biblical lens or if he's trying to understand it through a biblical lens or if he's trying to understand it through maybe a slightly biblical lens, more of a Mormon lens. I, I don't know. That's what I'm truly, really trying to dig into and understand and fully. Um, if you guys have any comments about anything I said or anything that was said here. Why, let's go to David first. you have anything? Not much. Um, all I know is if the media is getting involved, then propaganda isn't cheap. So yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure they're there to make money, to be honest. Maybe they are. I don't know. Matthew? Yeah, I'm wondering, is it the secrets of Skinwalker Ranch? I know that's like a show. That has been produced. I don't know if it was with this guy's tenure. He's, is he, this guy still the owner? Because it probably he is. was. Something like that, yeah. It's probably Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch. And uh, I haven't really watched any episodes of it, but I'm familiar with the uh, the concepts behind it and that they're doing investigations and through. Uh, it's a scientific lens, it's a secular lens. It's not necessarily a spiritual thing. I think it's more of, well, maybe they're acknowledging this could have a spiritual elements, but even then, you see a lot of the people who do like ghost hunting shows. They go out there with big boxes and electric. It's like we can qu we can quantify this. We can get <laughs> data and then we can compare and contrast and we can we can make a science out of uh, spiritualism. It's kind of funny. They're trying to have the best of both worlds in that way. Yeah, exactly. Best of both worlds, so you can. Uh kind of influence what people are thinking about what what this is that that's that's fascinating and so he's he's gonna go deeper into this and he's gonna state that same phrase again you've heard that phrase before as above so below why why does he do this let's find out um a, a little bit more about digging on the property here we go we were told that digging on the property resulted in negative negative outcomes, that people would be harmed, that any time the earth was disturbed, bad things happened. And taking into account the health and safety of those involved and the fact that this is a, this is a televised effort, this is an effort being documented by dozens of professionals 
arguably the leading documentary professionals in the country. I felt it was wise to be cautious. I gave Dragon specific direction to limit any digging activity, anything that would disturb the earth that may stimulate negative response that would result in injury or harm. And it was a, it really was a fear. It still is. We still have incidents that have occurred in tandem with experimental activity, with disturbing the earth. I mean, we had, you know, Tom Lewis, who, you know, last year ended up in the hospital in the emergency room with a cardiac e- episode that that occurred immediately simultaneous with digging activity into the base of the mesa. Was that a coincidence? I don't think so. I there was, you know, the 1.6 gigahertz that the frequency showed up. There was there was equipment malfunction that was captured on camera, and then unfortunately, Tom Lewis is is recorded going down on his knees with with a cardiac arrest, has to be run to the hospital by Dragon, and he's still being monitored. And thankfully, he's almost back to 100%, but it was really concerning. We've had a number of incidents where people have ended up in the hospital with mysterious illnesses and injuries. And a lot of those occasions seem to be attended by digging activity with with aggressive activity on the ranch. Um, Have I loosened that up since the first season from those first months? Yes. I mean, I, when my team tells me, let us dig, when I have Thomas Winterton, who spent a week in the hospital fighting for his life as a result of injuries that he believes and the doctors believe are connected to his activity on the ranch, when Thomas Winterton is hell-bent on digging deeper, both figuratively and literally, to find out what is happening, the mechanism behind this strange activity at the ranch, I, I have to defer to them. I, I have to give them the latitude to get to the bottom of the truth and take more aggressive measures to, to hopefully get some answers. And so we've relaxed it. We've added more safety precautions since. But uh, the no digging rule and uh, the mandate that I gave years ago has, uh, has been relaxed, but it's been as a result of both pressure and also respect, respectful requests from the team to be able to do their work. <clears throat> there's, there's so many aspects of this ranch that I want to cover. It's, it's hard to... I, I, there are so many different theories relative to what lies in the mesa. Have, have there been any discussions on what that excavation site might look like? Would it be like an archaeological dig? Yeah, ultimately. I mean, you have to treat it as an archaeological dig, but you first have to probe and, and have to excavate sufficient to, to make access without damaging the environment. So what, what you're going to see unfold over the course of the next few months the next year, I think, is a is an unprecedented effort to to more aggressively address the mesa and what lies beneath. Uh, as the 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 old Masonic symbol etched into the cliff uh, of the mesa denotes, as above, so below. We may find the answers to what we're seeing above in the sky, right there under our noses below the mesa, but we want to be very careful and responsible in how we, how we explore that area. Wow. Okay. There we go again. I want to, I want to say, I don't have too much to say about that. We're just covering it because I want to archive this clip because I believe we're going to hear more about this. Amanda in the chat says my theory, and I, I wouldn't put it past this. This is interesting. She says that my theory is sacrifices were made on this land, resulting in a ton of demonic and alien activity. It's very possible. There's there's something going on uh, very occultic uh, with some kind of spiritual aspect of this. On the other hand, it could just be the place that has been chosen to uh, conjure up the ideas and make people 
look into this stuff a little further. I don't know. Um, there's not much I, I, I can say about it. What, what do you guys think? This Looking at this from like a Mormon perspective, this theme of finding hidden secrets in the ground, it reminds me of Joseph Smith and the Golden Plates. Oh. You know, when he was first told about them, Joseph Smith was physically prevented from taking them out of the ground by an angel. And he was basically promised that violence would be done on him if he did so. Interesting. So I don't know if that's relevant to this. That's an interesting connection there. I, I, I knew that about the the Mormon lore, but I didn't I didn't put those two things together. Very good. That's interesting. That, that's why he's here, Brad. That's, <laughs> that's why right. that's why you brought him on. <laughs> so he could make that connection for us. Yeah, because I didn't I, mean, I know that story, but I didn't make that connection either. Oh. Uh, I do wonder how much of this is um I don't know, one of those games where you're giving them power. Mm-hmm. You're giving that you're obviously if you are involved with this project, you're very fascinated by it. I'm sure it consumes you. You go home from work. You're thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's secretive too. this guy. The owner doesn't want to talk to members of his family about it. I'm sure people who are working there, they're not coming home and necessarily talking about the weird experiences and all this stuff that's happening on the job. They don't want to scare I mean, Like I know. If I came home and I told my wife, oh, yeah, I'm working with a bunch of guys, and one guy was digging and he had a cardiac arrest, and I think it's because he was disturbing the ground because there's some weird, uh, <laughs> we don't know what going on, you know, she'd be terrified. She'd say, uh, yeah, quit the job. It's obviously not worth it. <laughs> but uh, I just I think, is it really disturbing the ground that is the danger, or no. is it giving giving these beings this this power, giving them... Like believing in them and saying they can do this to me, they can harm me, they have power over me. I'm weak, so it, I mean, yeah, it could be uh, disturbing the dirt. Or it could be, you know, hey, don't knock on the tree three times. You know, have you ever, <laughs> some of those urban legends too. Yeah. Oh, don't like stand in the mirror and say the name or whatever into the mirror three times, otherwise something will happen. Well, I mean, there's, I don't think there's anything necessarily going on when you do that, but. Exactly. It's that it's superstition. And I think that's where the power lies is can we convince these uh, these beings that we have power and if they do certain things, we'll hurt them. And uh, you putting like a faith in that almost yeah. I feel like it kind of green lights it for them. Yes. I think he is setting the stage, you know, planting the seed that maybe we'll find something here soon. You know, it's creating that mm. seed of faith, I guess you could call it false faith obviously but mm-hmm. interesting yeah, I, I think he's i i'm leaning toward more of he's a knave over a dupe right now but i'm <laughs> yeah, sure of course no you gotta gotta be suspicious of it especially uh, i think you're right too maybe uh being prepped maybe he himself is being prepped you know if if not uh that could be keep <clears throat> you know I, I always think that these people who are deceiving others, they themselves can be deceived. So it's uh, that's, that could be the boat that he's in. But uh, it's funny that you say that because there is a I've, – I've heard other people speculate, uh, and even Christians who have looked at this topic do say there's something about Skinwalker and they believe there will be some type of a revelation there, whether it be, oh, uh, uh, a UFO is buried on the property, some – alien technology right i'm using air quotes i can't put that they're not in the frame here they are (laughs) alien technology and uh ufos i don't think that's what this is i think it's part of a deception but that's what it's going to be presented to the public as to just lend credibility like i said that this is how it's going to go forward if satan is going to deceive the world by coming off as uh, an alien uh, being whether it be from another dimension what have you he, he's got to just stack the chips as hard in his favor as he possibly can. So that means on the t- to up until the point of his arrival, there has to be a huge list of just, look at this evidence. Like, how can it be denied? And then, boom, here I am, and I say, this is who I am, and I fit this description that I've given you. And before you know it, everybody's lockstep with yep. the deception. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I agree too. It's uh, you're giving faith to the demonic realm. They want the exact same thing. They want worship, and so you're giving faith to it. And, and they can point to it and say, "Hey, these these people right here, these are mine. They have faith in what we're doing, huh?" 
Uh, I'm going to skip the next clip. The next clip we're going to talk was going to talk about UAP appearing, uh, black hawk helicopters, and menacing presences. And there's not much I can say about that, but obviously, menacing presences. Come on, benevolent beings. I don't think so. We're going to go right into communicating with these things and what they they actually have discovered. This was this blew my mind, and I think it's going to become a lot more prevalent as time moves on. Check this out. It isn't a function of proving that there's something happening. That's already done. It's it's being able to identify the origin and the identity associated with the phenomena that drives me. And I think you can expect to see in the future, hopefully, some communication. I think whatever we're dealing with is highly intelligent. I will not be surprised if at some point we are able to somehow determine how to communicate or at least um, see, I think, more intelligent interaction. So you think this, what do you, what do you call this? Well, those who came before me with the Bigelow team called it a precognitive nonsense, what are they, there's a term. They, call, they refer to the phenomena at Skinwalker Ranch as a precognitive sentient non-human intelligence. So, so there's, there's okay. an intelligence that Based on the data, there is an intelligence operating on that ranch that has command over space time, over consciousness, can manipulate closed systems in a split second without leaving a trace, and I believe has the ability to communicate if we can understand or develop a common language at some point to be able to interact. Eric Bard, <laughs> in particular, has had communication with at least one of these entities involved with manipulating the systems that has command over the technology and the platforms and has expounded on that a little bit. Um, he'll be, I think, addressing that a bit more in the future. We're going to be discussing it on the docu-series uh, this next year. But he's definitely seen and, and documented evidence that we're dealing with an intelligence that does have the desire to communicate. What... Can you go into the communication a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, in, in his case, uh, when he asked out of frustration for a sign, when he commanded the when, – when the systems were being manipulated and he was dealing with security violations that were occurring repeatedly with our, with our surveillance cameras, he, he literally asked – Verbally, out loud, if you have something to show me, show me. If you have something to tell me, tell me. And in that instant, the screen morphed, melted, and digitally composed letters. He had the presence of mind just as he did in October 2016 to screen capture what was happening with his iPhone, thank heavens, he proceeded to record and screen capture in real time what was happening with the uh, the equipment. And what was revealed was what I believe to be compelling evidence that we're, we're dealing with, with an intelligence that is at least willing to acknowledge and wants their presence known. Were you able to translate it into anything? Uh, yeah, it's... You'll, It'll be shown on television, but uh, but it's it it essentially had had the simple response again instantaneously of I living. I living. Wow! I I don't see Not enough red long. flags. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> how 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 long ago was this interview taken? I'm just wondering. 
I I'd have to look it up. I was sent to it. Uh, I was sent it just last week, but it might be out for a while. Uh, I thought it was something that we hadn't covered on here. So usually I do try to get the latest stuff. But if you go on, let me look that up real quick. Um, you Matthew, made it sound like there was going to be some news announcement. <laughs> yeah, that's what <laughs> I was going to say. It if, uh, did it air on television? Because uh, these some people make really big claims, and then you never see what exactly it is. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if this is one of those cases, just drumming it up. I living uh, said. <laughs> but look, I, I want to just say, notice what he's ascribing to them. He said they are precognitive, sentient, non-human intelligences. Well, first of all, non-human intelligences. Where have we heard that before? That's in uh, the congressional record of hmm. the United States at this fo- uh, at this point, folks. That is what uh, David Grush testified to Congress that we we're dealing with. We we're dealing with non-human intelligences. However, he did not as precognitive to mm-hmm. them, and that that does put them on a different level because the definition of precognitive is having or giving foreknowledge of an event. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's the definition. Who who is precognitive by that definition? As Christians, who can tell you? The end from the beginning. It's God. This is a power that God has, not a power that these non-human intelligences have. I totally believe they're non-human intelligences. 100%, I'm on board with that. Yep, you're correct. But they are not precognitive. And Mm. they also do not have total mastery and control over time, space, consciousness. Like he's saying, he is deifying Right. These beings, he really is making them out to be gods, and they have—they're powerful, and it makes sense because what happened in the ancient world? They were gods to the ancient people, right. and I, I imagine it kind of irks them that they're not being revered the way they were before. They're not quite being put on that pedestal. Sure, people are curious about them. There's a mystique surrounding them, and uh, there are shows and movies and everything, books written about them. But they're not being put on that pedestal they want to be put on. We know that's Satan's goal. He wants to exalt his throne above that of God. So this this man, unfortunately, the way that he's going about talking about them, he is he's putting them on a level that they want to be put on. Which, as Christians, we have to recognize what they are. These are fallen angels. God created them. They are powerful. As far as relative right relatively they are powerful compared to what we are capable of doing but relative to god almighty no not even close not even in the same ballpark the same state country whatever (laughs) dimension (laughs) (laughs) multiverse whatever the new phrases are that you want to think of it as as far as day is from night that is the difference the power differential between the true god and these beings and we have a friend in that true God. Amen. So take heart in that and just understand that these they're going to be hyped up, but they are they are nothing. We are we are eventually going to have a moment where we see Satan as the worm that he is, not not the dragon he loves to portray himself as, but a worm and we're going to say this is this is the one that deceived the nations. This is the one that caused all this trouble. Look at him. He's so weak compared to God. Yeah. Pathetic. Nothing. Absolutely. We can have that view now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's happening. Uh, that's happening right now. Everything is... And, and I, I wonder how much... I still wonder how much Bible this guy is integrating into this. Why he's looking into it so hard if he knows that these things are demonic. I am curious how he's going to reconcile this with his beliefs. Mm-hmm. Do you know if he gets into that? He does. At the end here, I got two more clips. Uh, we're going to talk about his um, security, actually his uh, technology officer who's monitoring these things. He has a different uh, telemetry systems that he calls Satan and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> of course he does. And, um, and then... Cool. We're really going to get into his faith a little bit more and talk a little bit more about Mormonism in the, in the second clip. <laughs> so, if you want, we can jump right into that, if, unless you have something to say. All right, here we go. <laughs> Eric is principal investigator and chief scientist at Skinwalker Ranch, resides on the property full-time, literally lives in the command center, and is monitoring all of the platforms. I mean, these are proprietary platforms that he has created. I mean, 
Satan, which stood for <laughs> Sentinel Assignment, uh, Telemetry, something Come node. Come on, man. Look at him. Look at him trying to break. I've got to pull it. It's been a while. Look at him. He can't even it, do it. And by the I way, there's nothing Satan. insidious. There's nothing dark. It, it was just oh, a funny oh, acronym good. that he pulled out of the air I, that actually matched up with the proper description of the I'm platform. I'm laughing, Brandon. Um, it know, is he, funny. He I'll give you the, that. Uh, the uh, part of the surveillance platform that is um, capturing the events, Eve, event, viewer, something extraction. Um, he, he has a number of, uh, of really fun names that he, he assigns to the fun. various technology platforms there at Skinwalker Ranch. And that, you know, we're, we're preparing to deploy more technology than ever. The months ahead will turn heads. Uh, the, the, the level of sophistication and the, 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 the number of sensors and, uh, and really the technology that we're deploying with partners like Omnitech, I believe will, will re- reveal incredible uh, insights. Just Although I have to acknowledge, Sean, I don't think we're in control. Oh. Yeah, with, with all humility, we are, we are not in control. Whatever we are dealing with, whatever we are interacting with at Skinwalker Ranch appears to be several steps ahead of us and has such advanced capabilities that it's important that we address it with humility and reverence. I think uh, a lot of this is being revealed because it wants to be revealed. And I know that may sound hokey, but I, I, I believe that certain things are probably being manifest and shown to us as a result of our stewardship and, and working to sincerely engage the phenomena. That is beyond me right now. Um, okay, let's recap. What, what did he just say here? His, Eric, his chief investigator, uh, uh, has named the thing Sentinel Assignment Telemetry and Node, Satan. And uh, he also has another thing that's monitoring him, these proprietary monitors called uh, EVE, Event Viewer Extraction. <laughs> and he says that, yeah. I don't think that we're in control. Then, this thing's always one step ahead of us. Yeah. Pretty soon he's going to have the uh, the sensor integrated network. Uh, we'll be on the ground soon to monitor this activity. We're going to have plenty of that around. Sensor yeah, this is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, we've got. Uh, we just happen to have six hundred and sixty six of them scattered around <laughs> the the ranch. Uh, just a coincidence and nothing sinister. Nothing sinister. Oh here, folks. man. Okay, I see in the uh, in the chat we got Trevor is asking. Uh, do I think? Th- Matt, do you think this guy knows the stuff is satanic? It comes across that way to me. Uh, yeah, I, I think he... Come on. He knows more than he is letting on. Uh, I'm going to just put that out there. Because uh, if he's willing to share this type of stuff on air, believe me, there's there's some weird stuff that happens, even in uh, military operations where that stuff is monitored. Um, you can look at certain command patches that have demons on them and uh, pentagrams and... All sorts of really bizarre stuff uh, that you can find on like dot mil websites in their archives. So, uh, independent operations like this, yeah, I, I believe that there's some occultists on board, and, and that's why they're obsessed with this stuff. And they they name their stuff like this. They're just kind of winking at you. Oh, I see you. I know what you're about. Yeah. I don't know. Put your percentage down in the chat. I'm thinking like 80% knave right now, 20% useful idiot. <laughs> well, I mean, there's there's so many aspects to this because there's the truth behind it, then there's the lore that they're presenting, and then there's all the chaos that that that, that ufology has put out about it. That's complete lies. <laughs> and so I, I I think there's there's like layers. You got to peel back like an onion in order to get to the truth here, and um, and we found we have the truth. The truth is found in God's word, and so we don't really have to go too too deep um, in this. But I think the fa- at the same time, 
there's there's a lot going on here, and we're going to get more into his faith here in this next clip. Matthew, you sighed deeply. Did you have something else to say? No, it's just that uh, this stuff is just always seems to be present. It's one of those things. When I was first waking up to the reality of the world, I would just be shocked over and over and over how there's like weird satanic symbolism or you know things like in there's like an old Ford advertisement that was in magazines and it's like what's on the plate it's like 666 is on the plate it's like what this is just a it was like a, an illustrated illustration of like an old ford and it's 666 on the license plate and if you don't see it there you just don't recognize it there was um what was it oh and um this is something i picked up on uh in Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction, do not, I am not advertising anybody watches Pulp Fiction. It's a really disgusting movie, <laughs> awful, but there is a scene early on in the beginning and it's uh, this famous scene where Samuel L. Jackson is like misquoting the Bible, essentially saying like putting himself in the position of God, vengeance, I'm taking vengeance and all this sort of stuff, but there's a, a case and it. it's locked, right? And it's one of those old combination briefcases. I'm going to give you one guess. What? It's a three-digit code to open that briefcase. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Do you know what I mean? It's 666. It's like it's right there. There's always stuff like this. It is it is so annoying. That's why I laugh. I mean, like I'm not necessarily laughing because it's uh, it's like an exasperated laugh. It's like this is so tiresome. Like I'm, I'm just done seeing this stupid stuff. They're obsessed with it. And it's <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Because it goes to show there there's an obsession. This is like consuming you. Like I, I love I love God. I love Jesus, and uh, you know I feel like that relationship I have with Him is so healthy and productive and good for me. And it's like, what is their relationship with Satan? Well, I have to like sneak him in everywhere I go, and I have to keep it under wraps, and I can't go on air and just blatantly say that I worship him. I have to be sneaky and uh, lie to people and uh, sacrifice human beings and that type of a thing. It's like, oh, that's disgusting. Why are you doing that? You're you're doing all of this to have a relationship with a loser? Hello? <laughs> it's politics. That's what Morneau says. He says that everyone just uses politics. It's not politics. If you have one thing, and I, one, if, if, if you have two teams, you have an amazing team of people, and you have the team that's, uh, that's not very powerful at all, who are you going to side with? I mean, obviously, God is more powerful than these created entities. So I think, uh, I think whoever is siding with these things, they've lost their mind, and they're, they're, they're confused by the idea of being able to do what they, they desire and getting what they want in, a, in this short period of time in earth that Satan has allowed them to do. And I, I'm, I'm saddened by that, but that's what we're happening. That's what's happening right here. And we got more about that, talking about his, uh, his faith background, what uh, has affected his faith, and uh, about this stage in what he says is evolution. I don't understand how, and, and maybe you can speak to this um, maybe after he says it, uh, David, but uh, what in the world... Is uh, is he talking about evolution? And is there evolution based in, in in uh, Joseph Smith's writings? I, I don't even know. Um, I'm uncertain, to be honest. Uh, okay. We don't believe humans evolved. Obviously, we believe in the Adam and Eve story. But as for the evolution of other animals, I suppose so. I mean, there's no for or against it in the church. I would say. Interesting. Uh, before we go into the next clip, thank you so much, Michelle, for the super chat. She says, keep it up. And uh, we're going to dig further and further into this stuff every week because we do this every week. And we also have extra stuff that happens in the, in the, in the uh, what's it called? The Patreon, patreon.com slash strange normal. And if you want to chat with us 24-7, uh, seven days a week, we are in our Discord private server, and you can access that through joining our Discord server. Uh, we would love to see you there. If you think that this is an important topic, because this is part of what is happening, what is going to happen spiritually to the world very soon, join us and help us continue pushing this agenda of Christ-centered uh, spirituality and uh, to kind of thwart the enemy's, uh, what is the word I'm looking for, uh, battle. His, 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 we're trying to get ahead of this whole thing right now. And that's essentially what we're doing. Help us research. It's really fun. 
Let's go into our last clip, guys. This is interesting stuff, especially this last part at the end. And he uh, goes further into his, his beliefs and his as above, so below uh, thoughts. Here we go. There's one more thing I want to cover. It's, it's, we had a discussion last night about faith. And I shared my journey with you. And you had mentioned that, I, th I, I believe I asked you how this has affected your faith. And, and you had mentioned that since you have owned the ranch, it has actually strengthened your faith. Yeah, shockingly. How is... I'm not familiar with the Church of Latter-day Saints. I, I did a little bit of research and it sounds like, how do I describe this? It sounds like the earth is not the center of the universe and you don't believe that we are the, the only beings in the universe. Correct. Uh, Sh Sean, I, I was raised to believe that there are worlds without number, that we're not alone in the universe, you know, Mormon theology speaks to, you know, the fact that we're not alone in the universe, that we're part of a divinely constructed, intelligently designed reality, that there's a higher power, that the nature of reality and, and really our place in the universe is much more complex than we can even comprehend at this stage of our evolution. What I have seen at Skinwalker Ranch, what we are documenting, has, has only strengthened what I was raised to believe, that we really aren't alone, that there, that there is something more at play here. And it could be interdimensional or multidimensional. I mean, anyone who believes in an afterlife, if you believe that you're consciousness or your soul or spirit or whatever you want to call it survives after your body is destroyed or you die. Congratulations. I, I think you believe in a multidimensional, you're, you believe in interdimensional theory in, in that, that physics. And I think that what we're, what we're seeing at the ranch could very well be partially interdimensional in origin and nature. And people ask me all the time, is, is what you are documenting, is it ET? Is it extraterrestrial people from other worlds? Is it interdimensional or multidimensional phenomena? Is it time travelers? Or is it spiritual? Is it, is it angels and demons from other realms? And the veil between this world and those realms of existence or reality is very thin for whatever reason out there. Which is it? And my answer, honestly, is all the above. Right now, the data seems to point toward a diversity of origins, agendas. And I don't think you can ascribe these events to any one phenomena or any one point of origin. I think there's a lot of things happening for whatever reason that seem to be converging on this property. And, you know, the veil could be thin between this world and spiritual realms or this world and other worlds. There may be a portal or a wormhole to other worlds, to other planets that for whatever reason it occurs on this property. There could be a stargate you know, buried in the Mesa yep. that enables an interstellar highway to exist above and even below this property. <laughs> Something is happening. As above, so below. We're observing phenomena that continues to defy conventional explanation. That's the third time he said that. Third or fourth time. I'm not exactly sure. But... Um there, his, his final reference to as above, so below. We've heard that over and over again. I think we're going to hear it over and over and over and over again as we continue through this because it's a spiritual reference. This whole thing is spiritual. And if, you, if you've if you been watching this program and you haven't figured that out yet, oh, why? <laughs> this is, keep watching. Yeah, <laughs> That's keep watching. my advice. 
<laughs> no, yeah, that's fine. Because uh, we'll we'll continue with this. We'll continue on and on and on. And this is going to become more and more and more obvious to the point where I hope you feel you have a very fair choice to make at yeah. the end of the day. That you see this phenomenon for what it is. You identify that it is evil. It's from Satan. Satan is real. And then I want you to also have the realization that God is real and God is the enemy of Satan. And you have a choice to make. You don't have to live under this terrible influence of the devil. That was one of my things when I when I was really uh, in the midst, in the throes of a very bad time. And it led me to full surrender to Jesus. What was it? I, I remember saying the words, I don't want to be ruled over by demons. I said that out loud because it's such a dreadful, terrifying thing that these really malicious, evil, like, ooh, survival of the fittest, you know, it's, it's that thing. I'm going to throw each of you a spear in this pit and I want you to kill each other and I'm going to sit in the box and watch and laugh. Like, that's that's what the character of these beings. It's awful. We have the character of a God who loves you and is compassionate. And how much does, does God love you? Well, Jesus bled and died on the cross. There's no greater love than that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's defined for you. When he goes on and on talking about these uh, interdimensions and he's using these terms to uh, really <coughs> try to nail down some of the spiritual aspects uh, and realities of the world we live in, um, I don't necessarily go down that road. I think it's very hard for us to grasp spiritual realities and understand it. And I believe that because in the Bible, Jesus, and I'm going to go to Matthew 13, 44, check this out. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And what does he do? You know, does he say the kingdom of heaven? Oh, it's like, it's an, okay, sit down guys. It's another dimension and it's access through portals. And we do this, do this, blah, 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 blah. No, he doesn't overload you. He goes like, he says it like this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. This is how Jesus goes about talking about spiritual reality. He uses parable to, to connect with us and give us that understanding. It's not just, um, like I said, it's not a science lesson that he's going down because Obviously, I think there's, for good reason, we are not capable of fully grasping that. But I think we have all eternity to really delve in, figure it out, uh, have communion have communi with the one true God, with the holy angels. There are good angels that we're going to, I think, befriend. I mean, they, they, they seem pretty friendly. <laughs> the good ones do. You know, in uh, Revelation, they call John their fellow kinsman. That's pretty cool. An angel seeing you as a fellow kinsman, you worship the one true God. Yeah, so do we. Yeah, you know, it's like great, glad, glad to meet you. There's good things to come, but I don't think we need to stress out necessarily about trying to explain uh, the mechanics of of what happens here. I think we could just stick with the Bible and teach as Jesus was teaching with the, with the stories that God has given us in the Bible. This is how we can reach our our fellow man. And really make sense of of the phenomenon. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's interesting that he says, uh, like you said, this has affected his faith, and uh, it it that indicates to me that he still does believe somewhat of what he believed or what he has come up with, uh, at least in a spirituality of some kind. And he, and so he said, and and for me as well, when I realized that the, there there are demons, there are actual physical demons, and they are they are affecting our lives. Then I realized, you know what, maybe this God thing is actually a real thing, too. And I think that's the whole reason why this demonic realm went underground, and the whole reason this channel exists is to, to show, hey, look, if there's one side of the coin that's coming out right now, there's another side of the coin that's also going to be here and also going to help you out. And so it's very important that everyone stay in the Word, stay focused on understanding what the truth is, and don't be confused by what 
is to come because let's get ahead of it, folks. Let's talk about this. We all do need to talk about this. And I trust when you watch this program, you do know your Bibles. And so when I make references to like, uh, let's see, we were talking about going two by two. Everyone should know that's a reference to scripture. Uh, Go two by two in the Bible. It's what Jesus sent his disciples out as, two by two. And that's uh, essentially a a principle even the Mormon church took, and they use that when going out. And I think many other churches do too, or should. And um, even when you are talking with someone, it's such a big advantage, just from a logical uh, uh, point of view, that when one person is talking, another person can be thinking or praying. When one person is, is doing the talking again, the other person can be thinking or praying too. And that way, when you're talking to a family, or maybe just one individual person, it's much easier because you have someone to talk about it with bounce ideas off as much as what we do on this program right here, which is why we have multiple people on. And with that, I want to go, I want to toss it to, uh, to, to uh, David. Why couldn't I remember your name for a second there? David, thank you so much for joining us on the program today, and I appreciate your thoughts on, on everything. Do you have any thoughts before we uh, uh, jet out? No, you're muted. No, uh, thanks for having me on. Very good. Very good. Lots going on, and lots, and thank you for uh, 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 what you do too, Matthew, here tonight, and bringing, bringing it all back to us. Uh, would you close us with prayer unless you have something final to say? No, uh, I can pray us out. Cool. For sure. This guy's name, Brandon. Um, Brandon, what, I don't want to mess it up. I want to know what his name is. Brandon Fugel. Fugel. Fugel? F-U-G-A-L. Fugal, right? Yeah. Fugal, whatever. Father in heaven, we want to offer this prayer tonight for Brandon Fugal uh, that we were listening to, uh, hearing his thoughts. He does seem to be a, a confused man. I, I, My hope is that he's more confused than anything else. And the one that can clear confusion, the one that can give a sober mind and give someone purpose and direction, true purpose, true direction, that comes through you and a solid relationship with you. Lord, we pray that you reach out to him, that he reaches out to you, and that a relationship grows there. And ultimately, there's something beneficial that can come out of all the things we heard tonight having to do with skinwalker ranch it sounds awful that people are getting hurt and and there's these really bad occult practices happening there lord we just want to we want to hear that these things were used for your benefit ultimately for your glory that you can turn tragedy into joy and you can turn the sufferings into something that plants the seeds and has them grow and we're just so grateful thank you for getting us on here tonight and just having really wonderful discussions in jesus name amen Amen. praise god thank you guys hang out for just a second and i'll uh come right back to you so we can do a little bit of a short 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 post show Folks, thank you again for joining tonight. It's been real, it's been fun, and it's been real fun. (laughs) I I bet that um, next week is going to be even better. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that bell icon. If this is inspiring to you and it's important that we get this message out, as as I feel it is, join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash strange normal, and join us on Discord so we can communicate more often and uh, help us research. Guys, my name is Bradley, and this has been Pure Strangeness and Absolute Normalcy. Strange normal. Talk to you soon. You're watching Strange Normal, where the truth is the truth.